This is CBC Here and Now. Protests take over. Mun students temporarily shut down the Board of Regents meeting. I know more people that do drugs than don't do drugs. A central Newfoundland man wants more done to prevent fentanyl deaths. Every time we put that sub in the water, we were seeing things that no one had ever seen before. A local entrepreneur creates the best underwater cameras in the world. Well, here on the surface, we are looking at more drizzle and fog tonight into Friday, but some improvements as we move into the weekend time frame and, of course, for Mother's Day. The details are coming up. Mun's big meeting to finalize its budget today was unexpectedly thrown off course when protesters crashed the room. Yeah, the Board of Regents was meeting to make a decision on the proposed fee and tuition increases. Here and now's Martin Jones was there. He's joining us now live outside Gushu Hall. Martin? Thanks, Debbie. It began as your run-of-the-mill protest here at Munn. Students met on the other side of campus, while the Board of Regents met behind me to finalize their budget. But when students arrived here, things soon escalated into anything but normal. Students began by chanting with, with their picket signs, but they were soon let in through a side door. That allowed them to flood into the meeting room, bringing that meeting to a grinding halt. It forced the Board of Regents out and into another room. After that, I spoke with one of the lead organizers, Alex Knoll. Student at Munn is the lowest in the country because students have fought for it year after year after year, and we've, uh, for the most part, kept it that way. So we're not willing to compromise that. If we see a small increase now, that could lead to a much larger increase over the coming years. And I think the university has a much more long-term plan for fee increases uh, than they're letting on to. Things did settle down after word that the police had been called to the scene. Organizers advised international students and any protester with a criminal record to go home. That reduced the group to about a third of its original size. The police never actually arrived. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Martin Jones. While those inside were shutting down the Board of Regents meeting, the protesters that were outside Guju Hall were just as direct. Their target, Provost and VP Academic Noreen Golfman. She's been at the center of controversy this week. Earlier, it was her reaction as she entered a Senate meeting. Some students accused her of sticking out her tongue. And just a few weeks ago, when she was asked about taking expensive lunches with job candidates, Golfman said, well, we're not feeding them peanut butter sandwiches. We are doing what professionals do. It's the person that the university spent hundreds and thousands of dollars hiring to represent this institution? Is this the person that publicly takes joy in throwing out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when that is the main uh, thing that students eat on a daily basis? Shame! Well, now to the actual outcome of the board meeting today. The group was set to vote on this year's budget, and it was controversial, with its proposed fee hikes for all students and a tuition increase for international students. With that part of the story, we're going to go to Here and Now's Cease Hare, who's with us live. Cease, what did the board decide? Well, actually, Peter, the board basically approved what the Senate was told two days ago. It's going to cost more to go to Memorial University. And it'll come in the form of tuition down the road and also fees would start this fall. On the tuition side, international students in the fall of 2018 will pay an extra 30%. Now, that's for new international students in 2018. Uh, all of the other fees, all of the other tuition fees will stay frozen until 2021, about five years from now. And, of course, the freeze for NL students remains in effect. It's the non-NL students that will eventually see their fees go up, internationals, in about 18 months, the new ones. So the students who are here now are being grandfathered in down the road, that's when the tuition starts going up for non-Newfoundland students. On the fee side of the equation, it's a lot of money. We're looking at a generation of about $9 million 
in extra cash for Memorial University in the campus renewal fee and the student services fee. That kicks in this fall. I spoke with one student. She wasn't happy that the university was fixing its money, sh m money problems on the backs of students. It is our right and it is the public's right to know what they are what they are doing with our money. This isn't just the students' money. This is the public of Newfoundland's money. We have a right to know what they are doing. And instead of you know figuring out other ways so they could save for us, that so they could you know protect the most vulnerable students, so they can protect Newfoundland and Labrador, they're just going to download everything on us. That is shameful. They are cowards. So if you're a student going to Memorial University this fall, you're paying for a new campus renewal fee for undergraduates. It's $50 per course per semester. So if you take 10 courses over two semesters, that's an extra $500. And the student services fee for two semesters would be an extra 100 bucks. So that's an extra $600. And a lot of people are saying that it doesn't matter if you call it a fee or a tuition increase, it's still extra money coming out of people's pockets. The MUN president, Gary Ketchinowski, makes no apology, apologies for the campus renewal fee. He says they had no choice but to tackle the infrastructure problems on campus. House was that infrastructure on campus needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, we simply can't continue to uh, offer, uh, say we're offering 21st century teaching and learning and research uh, in 20th century infrastructure that is falling apart. And so uh, our responsibility is to uh, say, how are we going to be dealing with this? Now, many times during this year's budgetary process, there have been calls for Gary Kachanowski's resignation. We asked him about that today in his office, and he says he has no plans to step down. Reporting live for Hair Now, Cease Hair, CBC News, at Munns Campus. Well, talking about another fee increase, the Public Utilities Board has put the brakes on a 20% proposed increase to power rates. And this is one thing that has nothing to do with Muskrat Falls. Hydro blames the fluctuating price of fuel. If it uses more oil at Holyrood or the price of oil goes up, it needs to collect more money to cover that cost. So what would that increase do to a power bill? Well, right now, the average bill for Newfoundland power is $144. If this rate increase was allowed, it would bring rates up to $171, an increase of 18.6%. Now that's something the PUB wasn't happy with. It was telling Hydro to come up with a new plan. It said the estimated rate increase for July 2017 is such a significant increase that it may be argued it would cause rate shock. Well, how does this compare to past power rates? Well, the price per kilowatt hour for electricity has fluctuated. This increase would make power more expensive than we've seen, but only slightly higher than what people were paying in 2014. Now, just moments ago, we spoke to Hydro, and clearly they've been listening to the PUB because they say they've submitted some new options with smaller increases. They're still looking for more money, but the increase would be between 9 and 11 percent. We'll keep you updated on how the PUB responds. The English School District has cancelled a busing contract with Kellaway Investments. The company is facing charges of operating buses that weren't properly inspected. Owner Jim Kellaway told CBC News that since then, all the buses were independently inspected, but the school board cancelled the contract anyway. Now he's talking about a lawsuit. I believe the school district wanted to be the judge and jury here, I, you know, but we, we took steps which cost my company several thousands of dollars each bus to, to go out and have them independently inspected, which they all passed. Well, there's another push tonight for a provincial ban on single-use plastic shopping bags. The organization that represents towns and cities is asking people to take photos of the discarded plastic bags they see and send them to their members of government. Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador says it shouldn't be too difficult for people to find plastic bags near their property. They want the picture sent to Environment Minister Eddie Joyce or Service NL Minister Perry Trimper using the hashtag ban the bag. Big news tonight for people who use Aeroplan points. Air Canada is ending its contract with Aeroplan provider AMIA. The airline will launch its own loyalty program with the, when the agreement expires in 2020. 
Air Canada says the new program will offer more personalized service and a better digital experience for customers. If you still have Aeroplan rewards to use up, don't worry. Air Canada says it intends to continue to offer AMIA redemption seats after the contract expires. Well, a central Newfoundland man who distributes needles to drug users in Grand Falls, Windsor, is calling on health officials to do more to prevent fentanyl deaths. Central Health confirms it is seeing overdose cases and it's dealing with the problem. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Rodney White is operating a thriving business in Grand Falls, Windsor now, but he's seen some hard times living on the street in Ontario. I lived in crack cases and been surrounding trauma for a bit. Uh, it's homeless for a few years, right? And so you see the, you really get to see firsthand like how bad streets really are. White says he's opening a marijuana dispensary too. He knows a lot of people in central Newfoundland who use drugs. I know more people that do drugs than don't do drugs. More, I should say more people that do coke than don't do coke. And White says he wants to keep those people safe from possible fentanyl overdoses. He says it's happening more often than officials at hospitals like this one in Grand Falls know. They, they see a couple of people, but not everybody that overdoses or almost overdoses goes to the hospital. Most people I know, they won't even uh, step a foot in the hospital. A drug called naloxone can stop those overdoses. White wants health officials to give him naloxone kits so he can distribute them. Central Health says it's working on it. I think we had 200 come in in the last order and we distributed those to uh, the front line. Uh, but I don't think we had enough ki uh, kits at that point to, uh, to get them out, out into the hands of the people on the street. Some people like Rodney White are calling for a radical solution. They say legalize all drugs like cocaine and heroin, sell them over the counter and tax them. And make sure users have a safe supply and don't have to rely on unscrupulous, sometimes ruthless dealers. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, when Come From Away opened on Broadway, some people criticized the province for missing a golden tourism advertising opportunity. Now it appears some private businesses are step stepping in with their own campaigns. Here are now's Garrett Barry reports. The iconic Playbill magazine, everybody at a Broadway musical has seen one of these, and this month it's promoting a special giveaway put off by two Newfoundland businesses. One lucky couple will win a chance to come to this province to get the come from away experience right here in Gander. Come from away is performing to rave reviews and racking up awards. Now, businesses in Gander are expecting a bump. Hi, nice to meet you. Very Welcome nice to, to the you. North Atlantic Aviation Thank Museum. You very much. The Aviation Museum is creating the town's first bus tour. People were contacting the town, contacting the museum, contacting the airport. They were really interested in what you could do when you came to Gander. So we saw this demand and we figured we should give them a tour and kind of give them the come from away experience, we'll say. And if you're willing to pay enough, you can even eat with Gander's mayor. But is something missing? And I took them through Gander Academy. Diane Davis is portrayed in the musical and has mingled with potential visitors. So it would be nice if there was some kind of... Um, a map or a driving tour, and maybe somebody's working on this, hopefully they are, or even a web page that would help people to, um, to find the relationship between certain things that happened in the show. It's the first season for these Come From Away inspired tours. Both the Fogo Island Inn and Maxim Vacations are offering their own packages. Now, guides hope that visitors will find some of that Newfoundland hospitality that was showcased after 9-11 and inspired this Broadway musical. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. I think I'm shot. That's what a witness told the court he said to his girlfriend after he'd been hit with a blast from a shotgun. Two men in St. John's are on trial, charged with that shooting. Here now is Glenn Payette reports. Kyle Mullet looks very different now compared to four years ago when he was riddled with pellets from a shotgun. Christopher Shaw and Jason Marsh are accused of being accomplices in that shooting. Among other things, they're charged with aggravated assault and endangering a life. Mullet told the court he was in his house on Boyle Street when there was a knock on the door. He said his roommate looked out and saw three masked men. Mullet said he wasn't going to let them get inside, so he riled up his dog, a Labrador pit bull mix, and went out to confront them. Mullet said he jumped over the rail on the steps to give chase. The dog was in front of him. He says the men took off. 
Then he heard one of them say, let one off. He says a guy in a red hoodie pulled a shotgun out. Mullet said he saw a flash. He said he was pushed back and at first didn't really feel anything. He said he ran back inside and said to his girlfriend, I think I'm shot. He found it hard to breathe. She called an ambulance. Two pellets were removed from his neck, two more from his bowel, and there are still 22 in him. Mullet said the police were of the opinion that this was about drugs, pressed him on that and even got a warrant to search his house. He said he doesn't sell drugs, but had a friend who moved in with him after being busted for trafficking in marijuana. That friend had moved out a week earlier. It came out at a pretrial hearing that the RNC had used undercover officers to get to know Shaw and Marsh. They told those officers about a shooting with a shotgun, one shot only, and that there had been a big dog. The same as Mullet's story. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. After the break, we'll take you to Happy Valley Goose Bay, where these young people got to see firsthand what it's like to be in the seat of power. While he's at the top of his game when it comes to working with underwater cameras and robotics, later we'll tell you about Newfoundlander Adam Gobi and why people are taking notice of what he's doing here. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too.
Time to now to get a weather outlook from Ryan and Ryan, this is the time of year that I really wish I was back in Labrador because even if I was up in Nain, the very northernmost community in this province, I'd still be getting better weather than we're getting here. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty dismal. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but the sun did break through oh. in St. John's today for a few moments. Oh, wow. And yeah, that's right. Ooh. And we'll see that again tomorrow and again Saturday, but temps are still going to struggle over the next couple of days. We still will see rain, drizzle, and fog into the mix. Look at these highs today. Pretty unreal. Uh, just two in St. John's at the airport. And in fact, all up that northeast coast with those onshore winds, one or two degrees. That was it. Uh, the last couple of days we were creeping up towards four, five, and six. But uh, today, uh, with that to north northeasterly flow, uh, yeah, that was all we could muster. Uh, just four in Terra Nova, six in Badger. Yet 16 beautiful conditions once again on the west coast today. Burgio got to 13 degrees, as did the Buren Peninsula. It was a wonderful day for the south coast, the west coast, and Labrador overachieved as well. 14 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, 12 in Churchill Falls, 12 in Labrador City. Uh, and again, the, right on the money for the south and west coast today. And we'll be right on the money again tomorrow. Very similar setup for you folks. Uh, Labrador, I think pretty much similar tomorrow, maybe a little bit cooler. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. There are your current temps, just one in St. John's up that northeast coast. There's the flow. Guess what? Northeast winds and easterly winds across the west coast. And uh, again, nicely shielded from that cool air. And that's why you're warming up there. Uh, happy about the Goose Bay with an east wind today. There's the area of high pressure. It's pretty much in the same spot where it's been the last couple of days low to the south and we are seeing this onshore east northeast flow in between and the good news is this is finally going to start to change over the next couple of days area of high pressure is sinking southward we're actually going to be seeing some uh, drier air into the mix for tomorrow i do think we start with some drizzle and fog patches along the coast but like today we'll see more in the way of some sunshine, especially for inland areas. And we did see a fair amount of sunshine today. You look at the webcams, uh, Salmon Ear Line was uh, uh, sun and cloud mix yet again in the Narrows, pretty much couldn't muster up a sun break at all. But here at CBC, we did see some sun. So again, the f closer you are to the coast, the more you're going to see some cloud cover. And that'll be the name of the game again tomorrow. But for everybody, I think the cloud cover dominates across most of east, northeast Newfoundland for tomorrow morning. The Buren to Port Abbas to Cornerbrook will start uh, with a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow morning from start to finish. Again, chances some drizzle in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but everybody else is smooth sailing at 6 a.m. tomorrow. Once again, three, four degrees along parts of the coast, six to eight inland, and a very similar setup to what we had today, although I do think we will see some more uh, sunshine in the mix across the metro region. CBS is warm as eight degrees, and again, that northeast flow will keep uh, temperatures cool with sun, more sun into the, uh, into the mix in the afternoon. Clouds likely still dominating, though, uh, for St. John's proper, back towards Conception Bay North and Bonavista, a little more in the way of sun, CBS towards Clarenville, lots of sun. Placentia, St. Mary's Bay, down towards the Buren Peninsula. The south coast tomorrow will be beautiful from Harbor Breton back towards Francois. Also looking at, uh, again, that drizzle chances in the morning from Terranova, Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor. Retreating will be the fog, and we will see some sun breaks in the mix into the afternoon. The west coast and the southwest coast tomorrow will be dynamite once again. Burgio, Port of Basque, Stephenville near 16, Cornerbrook near 15 tomorrow. Uh, watch for a bit of drizzle in the morning. St. Anthony, Mary's Harbor, Cartwright, then some sun breaks into the afternoon. And for the north coast, again, Nain, likely near St. John's tomorrow with a daytime high near 4. Looking at uh, Labrador City, Churchill Falls near 10. A chance of drizzle happy Valley Goose Bay, temps near 12. That's your forecast Saturday, Mother's Day and beyond. Coming up, Peter. Thank you very much, Ryan. Well, a group of teens in Happy Valley Goose Bay have a better insight tonight into what it means to be a municipal leader. The students from Queen of Peace Middle School and Mealy Mountain Collegiate sat in the council chambers this week for a crash course on municipal politics. But they weren't just there to learn about municipal government. They were also there to talk about what matters to them. Today we, we will be presenting the idea of a crosswalk button to go from the Tims to the hospital. On many occasions, I have seen people try to cross the road by the designated crosswalk area, but were unable due to traffic, refusing to stop. 
Certainly, uh, it won't fall on the fears. Uh, we'll take uh, your proposal, your question, very serious. And uh, I'm glad that you came here today, and the first thing that you proposed was safety for all people. Also, with Muskrat Falls, this has been a topic that has divided our community extremely over the past few months. Everyone wants to keep our beautiful community safe and have it around forever. If you want people to stay here, you need to make sure it's safe for them to live here. Suicide rates have increased in the province, but majorly increased in this part of the province, and yet we seem to be the ones offering the least amount of help. Addiction has taken over our schools, and alcohol and drugs have become more than a scary party experience, and they've become an everyday. Drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, and even fentanyl have made their ways into our community and our school. Education itself is a step forward, but we need to take the real step and have the resources to help our people when they cannot find or get access to the help that they need and they want. We really appreciate the questions that you bring here to us, uh, and we'd like to see similar positive uh, questions come in our uh, regular council meetings. Well, here's a question for you to Google. What St. John's woman holds the position of Senior Vice President at Google? Actually, don't Google it. Debbie will introduce you to her in about three minutes.
know your company has arrived when its name becomes a verb, like Google. And you know you've arrived when you earn a job as one of Google's senior vice presidents. That is the case for St. John's native Catherine Courage. These days, she lives in California's Silicon Valley, where she was named one of the top women of influence there. But this week, Courage is home as a guest speaker at Innovation Week, and she joins me now. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Debbie. <laughs> Catherine, when I Googled you, um, you've got quite an impressive resume. Uh, Thank you. Accolades like top 40, under 40 back in 2011. Was landing this job at Google like a dream job for you? It absolutely was. I've been in Silicon Valley for 17 years now working for a variety of, of tech firms and Google was one of those brands that I always had on my mind that I would love to work for one day and suddenly the right opportunity came around at the right time and here I am. Okay, you have to tell us, is it at all like the movies? <laughs> <laughs> Working at Google, do you have playrooms and rollerblades and you know the whole shtick? <laughs> I have to say it is true. Um, they uh, treat us extremely well and it sounds cliche, but the, the mantra of work hard, play hard really, really uh, goes there. They want it to keep people incredibly engaged and realize they can do that through food, through outdoor activities, through exercise, through sports, through all those wonderful things that they, they offer. But they also expect a lot in terms of work. I bet, and uh, the pressure is on once you uh, reach that level, no doubt. That's right. Hmm. So Catherine, uh, Google, I think it's fair to say, is one of the companies that's shaping mm -hmm. the world, uh, setting the agenda. Um, what does that future look like? It's a really good question. There are a lot of very exciting things happening today. When you think of artificial intelligence, when you think of machine learning, we're really taking this large globe full of people and connecting them in ways that we never thought possible. So many tasks are being automated, whether it's self-driving cars, and there's just so much information accessible to people today. And you're gonna see even more and more things to help empower this global workforce and global population. Now, earlier today, you were speaking with some women. Mm -hmm. It was uh, called a tech group, Women in Tech Peer Group. That's right. Just wondering, what was your message to them? Mm -hmm. There were a variety of things that we talked about, but one of the key messages was really risk whether it is you and your career personally taking risks and chances because that's really what propels you forward or really encouraging risk in your company and I mean risk in a positive way in that if you're going to drive innovation you really need to try new and different things so we, we talked a lot about that today and good, had good discussion. I know you have a particular interest in speaking with uh, young women, mm -hmm. uh, women generally about um, how to get ahead um, and I'm wondering, when you look back at your career, was the fact that you were a woman in any way a hindrance mm -hmm. as you went uh, through your career in a male-dominated career? Right. It really wasn't. I am very lucky. I grew up in a family of very strong women who were wonderful role models to me. My, my mother uh, has a PhD. She has three other sisters who have each have a PhD and one has an MD. So I really felt I could do anything, which is a wonderful place in a, uh, to grow up in. And then when I went off to study, I was very lucky. It was the dot-com boom, and I decided, you know, I have a job lined up in Toronto, but why not go off to Silicon Valley? And when I got there, I realized for, for women who work hard, it's actually an advantage because leaning forward technology firms are looking for really talented women. They realize they've got a deficit, that they've got more men than they do women, and they encourage more women to come on board. They're actively looking to recruit more women. And so in some ways, I've seen it as an advantage. Hmm. What would be your message to young people uh, in school, girls mm -hmm. and boys? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they should really pr look at pursuing a career in technology. It is a wonderful field to be in. It's exciting, it's fast paced, there's so much to learn and explore. The other important thing to call out is that the rate of jobs is outpacing the number of people we have to fill them. So it is a wonderful career profession uh, and it is a perfect time to get in engaged. So for people to go off and study computer science or business or the arts, Technology careers are not just being a, a coder, 
it's a whole diverse set of fields. And so people should really think about technology and see how their skill set and passion can fit into that sector. And just finally, Catherine, I understand you're uh, on the province's Innovation Strategy mm -hmm. Committee. Uh, what are the possibilities you see ahead for our province that's been traditionally resource-based? Mm -hmm. Well, I, one thing about Newfoundlanders, I think we are incredibly resilient and we manage to learn how to reinvent ourselves. I think innovation is a key thing that we need to focus on now, so it's really exciting to be part of this committee. There are a couple things that we need to think about. One is that innovation, of course, is about startups and how do we get more people to think about um, using technology and creating great new companies from the ground up. But the second thing is really how do we foster innovation in some of these existing companies? How do we get them to go from local to national to global? How do we get them to think about the new products and services that they can be offering to their customers? And I think there's a huge opportunity for innovation there as well. Catherine Courage, very nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Wonderful. Thank you as well. Well, after the break, the story of the Newfoundlander who's turning heads with his leading edge work in underwater cameras and robotics. Welcome back to Here and Now. It's the best subsea camera in the world, and it's the brainchild of Newfoundlander Adam Gobi and his company, Sulis. Gobi's quest to create leading edge subsea cameras and robotics will be part of the CBC program, We Are Canada. It's airing this Sunday at 8.30 p.m. Island time on CBC, half an hour earlier if you're in most of Labrador, but we knew you'd want to see it now, so here's an excerpt. March 2012, Oscar-winning filmmaker and National Geographic explorer-in-residence James Cameron makes a record-breaking solo dive down 11 kilometers to the deepest known point on Earth, the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific. We have bottom. On board the sub is a pioneering breakthrough 3D camera designed by a team led by Newfoundland's Adam Gobi. To build a vehicle, to build a submersible, to take a man down to the deepest point on Earth, to one of the harshest environments in the world, is, is like the ultimate of an engineering problem. Every time we put that sub in the water, we were seeing things that no one had ever seen before. Nice. We discovered 68 new species between macro and microorganisms. 
After the Deep Sea Challenge's astounding success, more dives were planned, and Adam was asked to stay on. But he had other ideas. In 2012, Adam set up his own company, Sulis Subsea Corporation, to build better groundbreaking cameras that forge a new frontier of ocean discovery. And he did it back home in Newfoundland. I started Sulis to give researchers and scientists a window into the underwater world at a level of resolution that's, that's never been seen before. I think my biggest inspiration is the unknown and realizing that you know, there's only, there's, there's 95% left of the ocean to explore and that's what, that's what really drives me. To be on the frontier of ocean exploration is, it's thrilling. <laughs> it's about as excited as I get. <laughs> as a kid, we were, I guess I don't have a memory of becoming curious, I just always was. So I, I'd say it's just kind of built into me. I was always playing and building and tinkering. You know, I'd just be so active, just anything I can find, take apart, figure out how it works, or just, or just break it. At the university, I really became interested in, in robotics and artificial intelligence and the capture of imagery and, and then being able to bring that to the ocean. It was perfect. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Getting there? Working with his small crew of engineers and software developers, Adam's camera had to challenge the very laws of physics to succeed. We needed to push the limits, really. Mo most systems that, that go in the water, they put a, a you know, terrestrial camera behind a flat window. And because of the refraction of light is different in water than in air, it creates all sorts of problems. His efforts produced a revolutionary design that has better clarity than any other camera, with four times the picture quality and a quarter of the size of previous cameras used on submersibles. Yeah, that's good. Adam has a local supplier shape a precisely designed and fitted titanium housing for the camera to ensure it withstands the ocean's crushing pressures many kilometers in the deep. Here we go. Perfect. Here's your part, my man. Great. What's innovative about our titanium housing is the way we've integrated the optics and, and the size we've gotten it down to. It's good to lower it in. All right. Yeah. We need software to, to tie it all together, to get that image back through the tether up to the surface and provide a way to control it as if they were holding the camera themselves. Corners is still dark. It's... Other way. Yeah. Oh, we got a shadow. A little bit towards... The camera's remarkable image quality okay, and its good. nimble fit with submersible robots has made the Sula system highly sought after by the world's ocean explorers. Yep, that looks good. Looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. The Z70 is the main camera on a new submersible robot owned by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. It recently went down four and a half kilometers into the Western Pacific, in a region known for thermal vents and volcanic activity. The camera flawlessly sent images from the ocean's depths to 2.4 million viewers watching a live stream of the expedition from Schmidt's website. Researchers are now processing the enormous volume of findings, and one of them is world-renowned marine biologist Verena Tunnicliffe. It was really quite extraordinary. What we found were new animal species. We found new setting for hydrothermalism. We're looking at new lavas that came out on the seafloor. But the wow moment came as we settled down, and now you're zooming in and zooming in and zooming in, and now you're seeing the details and details and details. And that, for me, was the moment we were saying, ah, oh, that's fabulous. Now I can begin to count the bristles and so it really was a wow moment. Yeah. That camera wasn't just serving science. It was capturing people around the world to see what the deep ocean looks like, things that you would never dream existed. And that's where the advances in the camera systems and being able to share it really makes a big difference. So bravo. <laughs> <laughs> the weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's helping the world hear better. That's remarkable. Wow. Yeah, pretty wow. spectacular wow. images. Yeah. yeah. 
and uh, especially after your interview I with know. the woman from Google, you know, you're feeling a bit like, geez, what have I done with myself <laughs> lately, you know? But it is interesting, Catherine Courage from uh, Google was talking about the need for innovation and, you know, it's something that we can do in this province. And Adam Gobi is an example of how it can be done. Exactly. Absolutely. And once again, if you want to see more from that, the documentary airs this Sunday right here on CBC starting at 8.30 Island Time. Check that PVR right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, before we get to the weather, I have a question. What do you think this baby is happy about? Now, let me tell you why. Word is that he loves our very <laughs> own Debbie Cooper. Yep, this is little James Peckham, and he's only seven months old, or at least he will be on Saturday, and his parents Robert and Michelle say that every time Debbie comes on the television, he squeals with delight and just can't take his eyes off her. Isn't that so sweet? The parents must love me. <laughs> <laughs> Who and, doesn't? And Keep the children entertained. Just tune them into here and now. And, oh, yeah. little James, uh, we like to get our viewers, uh, start them young. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, you can't be too young to watch here and now. Mm -hmm. Debbie Cooper, baby whisper. <laughs> Okay, well, you know what, and it is true, and we got to say, it's not the first time you've heard no. that. And my no. little guy, the same way my wife would text me, doesn't care if you're on, but when Debbie's on, loves Debbie. So It has been said to me by parents over the years, so I don't, there must be something with the, the voice, the tone of the voice or something, but it's all real nice. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the pics, and uh, keep them coming. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to keep the weather coming uh, in terms of this big old, as I mentioned it last night, in case you missed it, when you look at that jet stream, it looks like the Greek letter Omega, and that's why they call this an Omega block. And we've got a high to the west, big trough of low pressure there over eastern Canada, edging into the Maritimes, and this cold pool of air is overhead for the last couple of days. We've got this northeasterly flow and this area of high pressure that has been blocking things to the north. It's starting to break down, and this area of high pressure in particular that's to our north is actually rolling southward. That will allow some little bit more in the way of some sunshine over the next day or so. Friday into Saturday, we're still going to be seeing the fog and the drizzle along parts of the coast, in particular cool temps with those northeast winds. That said, with that high edging southward, a little bit more dry air into the mix for the afternoon hours. And I do think we will see some sun once again into the mix for the metro region up the northeast coast, Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor into the afternoon after that fog retreats back to the coast, uh, which will be again the fog most persistent into the morning hours. There are those double digits and teens along the south and west coast yet again for tomorrow and in Labrador again, pretty dynamite day uh, for many away from the coast. Double digits uh, from Lab City to Happy Valley, the Goose Bay, just a chance of some morning drizzle for the Lake Melville region. Now, into Saturday, note this little band of cloud cover, an old tr trough here that's going to be keeping the clouds, I think, a little bit more dominant. The onshore flow here helping that as well, and that will keep uh, clouds, yes, dominant with a chance of seeing some drizzle for Saturday morning, even into the afternoon, thanks to that northerly flow. Temperatures are going to be in the 3-4 Five degree range, a little bit warmer inland, but it's going to be pretty chilly for St. John's again up that northeast coast. I think central Newfoundland, eight to as warm as 10 degrees, uh, looking at 13 for the west coast, 14 Happy Valley Goose Bay in eastern Labrador, 10 in Lab West. And again, that area of high pressure will then move to the east. That will finally shut off that northerly flow, although winds are going to be light on Sunday, so a bit of a sea breeze setup in. Note the wind contours here. I've got on the wind particles that you can see uh, lots of uh, arrows going in different directions, indicative of a very light wind. And so I think Seabreeze Central here with uh, 7 degrees, but as warm as 8 to 12 degrees for inland areas. 17 Central towards western Newfoundland as winds become light, sun and cloud, and that's some solid snow melting weather there, and you need it in Central. Long range setup quickly, and you can see this next system that's going to be rolling in. That will have winds shifting to the south Monday into Tuesday, and so temperatures are on the rise. Although we are turning a little bit wet, we will see temperatures into the double digits and teens yet again for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. Labrador, same thing in terms of uh, holding on to the warm temperatures, though the weekend and Mother's Day looking pretty nice indeed. Okay then, our young athlete of the day is six-year-old Chase Marr from St. John's. 
Chase participates in karate and is a member of the Rock Athletics team. Yeah, he's achieved his white belt and you can see him here holding his gold medal from a recent tournament. Fantastic work, Chase. We salute you as today's Young Athlete of the Day. Here's something to think about. Many students from other countries who are studying in St. John's find the cost of living so high they're turning to the food bank for help. That story after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Students who travel a long way to study at Memorial University in St. John's make up a small portion of the overall student population, but they make up the largest number of food bank users. The Munn Campus Food Bank says about 60% of their users are international students. Here and Now sees Hare has that story. The Munn Food Bank feeds a lot of students from Africa, the Middle East, India, East Asia, and South America. When you come from Africa, what you're used to eating is a lot different than we Newfoundlanders. Not much bologna in Africa. The challenge, Murphy says, is keeping a variety of items, not typical in the Newfoundland diet. We have the uh, lentils and we have chickpeas and things that I never ate as a kid were never in my, uh, you know, on my supper table when my mom put the food on the table. But handing out 2,800 bags of food a year to foreign students is no laughing matter. Murphy says non-North American students find it more expensive than expected when they get here. Money is tight for the graduate student, he says, and they're just scraping by. He says one student showed up the other day to save a buck just because of the talk of fee increases. He hadn't been here be since Christmas, but now he'd come back because he was, had to start saving up his money in case there was a fee increase because then he, he can't be short of the money, right? He's got to be, he's in his program and he's got to continue his program. Emma Lang is an international student from Massachusetts. She says her peers who use the food bank find it embarrassing and even deny using it. People are embarrassed because they don't want to tell their parents. They don't want their parents to know that they've come to this great university and their parents are, probably, are often sacrificing quite a bit um, to send them, but they're not able to eat. Graduate students saw tuition go up 30% last year, and in 18 months from now, international tuition rates will increase 30%.
Lang says it all puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth because things are just going to get worse for her peers. CSAIR CBC News, St. John's. Well, a special convocation ceremony was held at the University of Toronto yesterday. It's a little early for graduation, but the school made an exception for one extraordinary student whose doctors worry she may not make it until next month. Iona Romoliotis has her story. She doesn't look like a dying woman, and Priscilla Vegas refuses to let a death sentence define her. It's why she's here despite the odds and because of them. At one corner of my mind, I still feel that I have short time to live, but in another corner, I feel strong that I'm not going to die soon. The University of Toronto has never done this before. Hold a special degree ceremony a month before formal convocation. But that's how uncertain Vegas's future is. I feel very proud and uh, very satisfied that you know, we're able to recognize all of our accomplishments in this way. This is the fulfillment of a lifelong dream, a PhD in medical science focusing on trauma care and the story behind it, as extraordinary as this moment. Vegas had nearly completed her studies when she got the grim news. A rare form of abdominal cancer was spreading fast. She had only a few months to live. Rather than take a break, she plowed through her work while undergoing chemotherapy and surgery. Two years later, she's still defying the diagnosis. My daughter made it a point that I'm going to take that degree because she's the purpose of my life. This is what I had my quiz on. Her 15-year-old daughter, Jaden, is the inspiration and now the one inspired. Even though she had cancer, the fact that she continued and pursued what she wanted to do with her life made me extremely proud and I look up to her as a role model now. The journey of life brings both challenges and opportunities. She may have as little as a month, but deadlines have shifted before, so Vegas keeps looking past them. Cancer is not terminal, despair is. Doctors in Toronto are already putting Vegas's research into practice. But a remarkable academic legacy is already much more than that. Ioana Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Well, there's a stunning view of our planet tonight as seen from the stars. NASA has released this up-close and personal footage of astronauts on a spacewalk at the end of March. They're shown tinkering with the International Space Station to prepare for a new vehicle docking adapter. That's to be delivered on a future SpaceX flight. Just another day at the office, Peter, 400 kilometers high. Yeah, a little <laughs> trickier to do your job when you're floating <laughs> through space. Amazing pics.
Welcome back once again. Well, you've probably seen the videos of dogs and cats wedging themselves into boxes, but I bet you haven't seen pandas. <laughs> These twin pandas seem pretty taken with this plastic container. Their keeper had been using it to clean up bamboo. But even after she needed the container back to keep on working, Mm -mm. The pandas just couldn't bear to give up their new toy. Just like children, you know, <laughs> anytime you're trying to do a bit of work, they have to get in the way. Good stuff there. Uh, okay, quick recap, uh, more RDF along the coast, more sun for inland, south coast, and the west coast. And we will leave you with this picture. We talked about the oh. piebald moose last night. And there he is in all his glory. I believe it is a bull. Clayton MacArthur, uh, this uh, bull again, spotted last summer in the same area. And he looks like he's survived the winter and he looks like he's in pretty good shape. Wouldn't you do a double take if you <laughs> drove along and saw it? Thanks for sending that picture. And thanks to you for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Have a good night.